Hello and welcome to season 2 of Upstream Magazine, the podcast. We're so glad to make it here. After an amazing first season of uh, the podcast. What do you think, Nico? Yes, it was really nice. So, Yeah, and we're now back with season 2. And we're going to have some interesting episodes coming your way. And also, sometimes a changed new format for the episode. So stay tuned for that. But let's keep that all aside. And we come to the preview for the season 2 very shortly. But... This episode is a very, very interesting one. It's very relevant to people who are applying for the European Research Council-based grants, which have deadlines coming up really, really shortly. So this first episode is an interview with one of the scientific advisory officers at the ERC, Dr. Ino Agrofiotti. You want, you want to elaborate a bit on that, Nico? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, the starting grants for of the ERC are quite important for postdocs that want to start their own lab. So getting funding is always uh, good and uh, they provide some uh, good amount. And that means if you get an ERC grant, the chances that you get your own lab are quite high. So you would really want to apply for, for the ERC grants if you can. Definitely. And also just keep in mind, we've discussed a variety of topics uh, regarding uh, the ERC grants, the application form, what to write in each form or part B1, part B2, etc, etc. And also towards the end, there's something that Dr. Agrafioti would, or I coined it for her. We called it the seven commandments of Dr. Agrafioti for a good ERC application form. Just so the, keep that in mind and make sure to listen to the whole episode as we have discussed a variety of topics, including risk assessment, including uh, uh, what to put in different parts of your form and everything like that. So stay tuned and listen to the whole episode and we'll see you on the other end of the discussion for some interesting information on the season two of Offspring Podcast. Dr. Agrafioti, welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. We're very happy to have you with us here today. Perhaps uh, for our humble listener, could you please introduce yourself and your role at the ERC? Yeah. So, hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me. My name is Ino Agrafioti. I am the coordinator of panel LS1 of the ERC. Uh, I'm a biologist by background. Uh, I studied in the UK. I did a degree in Oxford in biological sciences and then a master's and PhD in bioinformatics at Imperial College London. Uh, I'm Greek, so I went back to Greece at the time, and I started working with astroparticle physicists. And uh, as I said, uh, they, I had the, the opportunity to do a podcast <laughs> there <laughs> with, a, with a colleague of mine, and uh, I haven't done one since. So it's, it's good to be back to do an episode again. Um, and the road, I helped people uh, in, um, then I moved to France in CNRS, and then I helped people apply for the ERC. So when I actually got the job, at the ERC, I knew also the other side, <laughs> how it is to to face this big ERC dream. <laughs> um, so, so I have this both background, and now I've been working for five years at the ERC, and I am in all starting consolidator and advanced evaluation. So I have seen probably more than two hundred fifty interviews and have looked through thousands of proposals. So I'm very glad to be here to share some tips <laughs> with the. Um, your people. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. It was really nice. Um, and also you came around quite a bit. Um, so maybe uh, just as a start, uh, could you maybe explain to us what the ERC specifically is? So who is the ERC? Um, and um, yeah. So the, the ERC is three things. The first thing is funding. It's part of, uh, it was part of Horizon 2020. Now it's part of Horizon Europe. It's around 17% of the budget of the whole program, uh, which translated in the case of Horizon 2020 to 13 billion euros. Now in Horizon Europe that we start, it's going to be around 16 billion euros. And you might say, okay, 3 billion euros more is not so much. Uh, but the thing is, you have to remember that this is for 27 countries. And the UK used to take 20% of the budget. So the excuse that there's no, fun, no money in research doesn't count. Like, there's a lot of money, so 
please come and get it. That's our, our, <laughs> our um, point. Then the second thing with the ERC, it's the executive agency. That's where I work. That's where the financial officers work. That's where we do the, all the implementation and we take care of the financial as uh, aspects of the project. And then the third, and it's last but not least, because it's the most important, when, we, when you hear ERC in the news, you hear about the ERC Scientific Council. It's run by 22 prominent scientists who are out there in the field. They are the ones who make the decisions. They decide where the budget goes, what kind of calls we have, what are our restrictions. So it's them who make the decisions, and it's also them who appoint the panel members. Uh, it's not like the rest of Horizon, the Horizon programs where people can apply to be a panel member. No, it's the scientific council that picks people. So these are the three, because sometimes we hear ERC and, <laughs> and it's three things. Okay, so with this, what is, does the ERC want to achieve? So what is the goal uh, of it? So, of it, so, there is, um, so there are different aspects. First of all, they, they want to support the best science in Europe because they found that there was a big gap in there and they wanted to create a, a, a competition at the European level. Uh, then they wanted to, to promote bottom-up frontier research because they found that there was not enough funding at the Euro, even at the national level for this, um, and they want to and they wanted to attract people from all over the world to come to Europe to do their research, and also to um, uh, to establish the next generation of top scientists to be in Europe. That's these were the main aims. So uh, because ERC is a rather large organization. So how is it structured? So how does uh, someone, uh, or which department exist and how does one approach the ERC? So we are around 520 people working at the ERC. So it's quite a lot of us. Um, I have, we have sort of, you could say four departments. We have one department that is um, communication and, um, and also there's a unit that is supporting the scientific council. So when the scientific council says, I want to find out about how many people with, uh, from Germany are getting these grants, then they produce the statistics, but they also help them with policy decisions and all. Then we have the administrative department, which is HR, IT, uh, lawyers, and all this. And then you have the scientific department, that's where I belong, where you have like loads of scientific officers, because basically the, the ERC, we have this we have panels. So in each panel, you need to have a coordinator and scientific officers who are working into it. So that's we are in three units and we have that. We also do ethics um, screening after the projects have been funded, have been chosen. So we have a, a unit for this. And of course, we have a unit to take care of all the logistics of the call coordination. Um, and, uh, and then we have... I think it's the biggest department is the, the finance, the, the project management department, because these grantees, they need support to how to make the grant agreement, the, the interim reports, and all. And these are the financial officers that do it. Um, they are sick. So that's how we are structured. Okay, yeah, I mean, 500 people, that, that's a lot. I didn't expect yeah. so many people <laughs> to be working there. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and then uh, maybe one thing you mentioned already before was uh, like Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe. So are there some major differences between the two? Like there's separate funding uh, periods, right? Uh, so I was, yeah, wanted to ask if there's some changes. So the, the idea, the, what they, when they announced Horizon Europe, they said that this is not, it's an evolution, not a revolution. Okay, so a lot of the things that, because uh, Horizon 2020 in general was well received. Uh, that they liked the, the, the effort done to, for simplicity to go a bit more, less bureaucracy and all that. So it's, it's continuing a bit towards that. But uh, there is um, there's a bit more focus on, on uh, focusing on innovation. So they have created this thing called the European Innovation Council. Um, so that's which is a bit like the ERC, but it's going to be a bit uh, more different. And uh, they have also they want to create more impact with what they call the EU missions, and um, and these are the main changes. So if you want to know about the ERC itself, it stays more or less the same. There are small differences, like the introduction of interviews in the advanced grant, uh, like some. 
when reviewers write reviews for um, at the between the step one and step two stage, from now on they won't be put grades. They will put uh, they will say whether proposals will be funded or not. Uh, this is starting this year, and um, what else? And also the ERC panel structure has been un- uh, uh, updated. So until from two thousand and seven until now, we've had twenty five panels. Now we're going to have twenty seven panels. And the choice of panel is very important when you write your application. So it's very important that your people look uh, like at the descriptors. It's at the end of the information of applicants and they see what is in its panel. Okay. So when you mention people apply, they apply for these grants, which is funded by the ERC, right? So what type of grants exist for uh, junior group leaders or professors? Yeah. And uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? So the first step, so we have three main grants, the starting, the consolidator, and the advanced. So for you, it's the starting grant. So that's two to seven years after the PhD. Um, it's, uh, this is what we call an eligibility window. This window can be extended. Uh, and I can, if you want, I can tell you the reasons why this can be extended. But uh, it's, um, uh, that's where someone fits and they need to have one publication where they have done a very big contribution to that in order to apply. That's the, the one criteria. Okay, and what about the other grants? Could you also just uh, give yes. a quick... so then you have the consolidator, that's 7 to 12 years after the PhD. So that's the next step. And then the, um, you have the advanced, which does not have a window, but basically you need to have 10 years of, a, of an excellent track record that has shown leadership. So that's a bit further up. And then in since 2018, we also have Synergy grant, but this is for, for multiple people. This is also eligible for, for someone who wants to, who is at the starting grant stage. It's not the synergies for people of all ages. Okay, so just to get, get this straight, so you have the starting grant for uh, postdocs that just finish, uh, and then they want to start up their group, and then you have the advanced grants for the ones that already have their group potentially, but then uh, the consolidator or the, the consolidator. Yeah, yeah. And then after that is the advanced. Yeah. Uh, that is for the fully established PIs. Yeah. And then exactly. you have the synergy grants, which are uh, based on collaboration, though, right? Exactly. I mean, it's not, Two to four people. Uh, uh, two to four people. Okay. Yeah. And these are big grants. They are between like they are ten million euros. Mm-hmm. Um, so and for six years. Um, but I should also say that the starting grant is one point five. Mm-hmm. But we will talk maybe about the budget. Yes, we will talk about the budget. Yeah. If I if I can give one uh, one advice, uh, because there is a rumor that uh, because we say two to seven years after the PhD, and there is a rumor out there that you have to wait until the last moment because then your profile will be most competitive because you will have acquired the most like publications and all that. And, and this is a real shame because we have statistics that show that the success rate is the same of, throughout the, all the years. It's not like the success rate is higher for people who, are, who wait until the seventh year. And it's, um, it's very important that people apply when they are ready, not when it's the last year. When you have the interesting data, when you have the interesting idea, that's when you apply. And, and, and sometimes, because the competition is quite high, sometimes just like getting the feedback from all these external reviewers and the panel members is very useful for your proposal. And just tweaking it a bit, it, it makes it successful. But if you have arrived at the end of, your, of the window, then you have to go immediately to the, to the next stage, which is the consolidator. And then you say, ah, but I'm not ready yet because I just, I'm just a starting person. So then you, have, you wait for another five years. So the adv- for us and the, for the panel, the most heartbreaking thing being giving A's at, the, at, at step two, giving, which means that if I had enough funding, you should be funded. And for you not, not applying the next year. That's uh, what we call the unfunded days because we have a restricted budget. So very often we have, like in my panel, say we have 25 people for an interview. Usually we have three or four people who get a B. Everybody else gets an A, but we can only fund a few. So it's, if these people cannot apply for the next year, it's very sad for us. 
Okay, so maybe we can uh, just quickly talk about the this um, the grading uh, of it. Uh, so uh, you mentioned already there's A's and B's. So what? Yeah. How, how does this uh, yeah. work? Yeah. So the ERC evaluation process is a two-step process. So we get all the proposals um, at the, um, after the deadline. We distributed them to the panel members. And then they have to do remote evaluation and they have to give a grade from zero to from two to ten. Okay. So this two to ten is for the project and for the PI. So five for the project maximum and five for the PI maximum. And uh, and then we take all these grades and we're sort of making a ranking list. Sometimes the balance use this ranking list, sometimes they don't, because we want to Uh, to make sure that we are not influenced. Like if someone has very big grades, that they will automatically go to the next round or not. So at this stage, step one, they get a C, a B, or an A. So if they get a C, they have to wait two years before they reapply. If they get a B, they have to wait one year. If they get an A, it means that they pass to the next stage. So if they get an A, what it means is that we send out the proposal to the external reviewers. These are picked by the panel members themselves, and uh, and we send them out, and we usually ask for minimum three external reviewers. So in case someone is very positive and the other one is very negative, to have a third one that maybe points to one or the other direction. So And of course, it's around four panel members who have also looked at the proposal. That's why, that's why when people get back reviews, they usually have a minimum of seven reviews, sometimes 10, sometimes 12, and they're like, whoa, so many people <laughs> looked at my proposal. Um, so then these people, they go for an interview, and they come for an interview, and then at this step, we can give an A, which means that if I had unlimited budget, you deserve to be funded, or a B, which means that even if I had unlimited budget, your proposal is not, is not working. So that's a B. And it's the A's, the top, top, top A's who get funded. That's a shame. Okay, so uh, in this structure, so after the second step, there even if you have an A, uh, it's not automatically that you're funded, right? So, um, it, what is the ratio rather? Do you have like only a few proposals that you would say are uh, funded based on their quality, or like how much does the quality differ in the A's? Then it depends on on the quality of the proposals and and the the panel. Like you have panels who just use. They, they just give A's to the ones who get funded and they have no unfunded A's. There are panels who have loads of unfunded A's. It depends on the quality. You have some years, you have like loads of really brilliant proposals. Some years you have fewer. It really depends on that. There is no, no proportion. But what, what the Scientific Council wanted to do was to make sure that the, the, once you go to step two, you know more or less that your success rate is one in three. Okay, so uh, this actually brings us to an important point because uh, we've been talking about what grades the proposals are given, but what kind of research does the ERC support, right? For example, if, if you have a certain research in certain fields, so how does the ERC decide how much funding is allocated to each area of research? So in the initial, when the ERC was created, they, so first of all, you should know that there's three domains. We have the life sciences, the physical sciences and engineering, and the social sciences and humanities. When the ERC was created, they had put a certain percentage in these areas. I think it was like 39% for the life sciences, 40-something percent for the physical sciences, and like 15 or 17% for the social sciences and humanities. But what happened was that depending on, on the number of proposals submitted, um, in some panels the success rate was higher than in other panels. So they said... If this is not fair. We have to make sure that the success rate in all panels is the same. So now the budget is allocated to different panels as according to the budgetary demand of its assigned proposals. So, for example, if in one panel you have 100 proposals submitted and they all ask, say, 2 million, then this panel is, is, is considered that they are requesting for 200 million. In another panel, if it's... Uh, a hundred proposals that they ask for one million, then the budget is considered one hundred million, and then they distribute the budget compared to that. And of course, in some areas, in the life science, the physical sciences, and engineering, 
you need more material. You need consumables, you need equipment. In some areas of uh, some other areas, you don't need. You just need a computer. So it's, uh, it depends on that. So it's, it, it's, the, it's not the number of applications per se, but of course, this is also influencing. <laughs> Okay, so also the number of good applications that uh, that the panel wants to fund in the end. Uh, so this is the this is the only problem with the system is that this does not look at quality. Like it, if it, it looks at numbers, we have two hundred applications. That's how we distribute the budget. It doesn't look if these applications are good or not. So this is a bit. So of the grading of the applications do not factor into this no. part. No. Okay. Okay, so I mean, you've read a lot of applications uh, in the in your time at the ERC, uh, right? So, what do you say? What is the kind of science this is being funded uh, by the ERC? Because I mean, saying okay, the best science is funded is quite subjective. As like I, as a neuroscientist, would say, of course, neuroscience should be funded. <laughs> um, so, uh, do you have like an um, idea of what the science proposals should look like in order to be funded by the ERC? Okay, so first of all, um, just to say that the ERC is, uh, it, we, we say that there's no such distinguish, distinction between basic and applied research. What we call is, what we want to fund is frontier research, okay? So you can have more applied and less applied, can, can, they can all be um, funded. Um, what I w wanted to say before is that, uh, is that the, this There's one criterion, which is excellence, and it's very broad and very big. And we keep saying to the panel members, excellence is the only criterion. <laughs> and, but this excellence applies to the project, and it applies also to the PI. So it's, uh, I have the, here the, so it's the excellence of the project is that this groundbreaking nature, the potential impact, the scientific approach, and excellence of the principal investigator is intellectual capacity, creativity, and commitment. These are the things. So for me, the, the proposals that usually get the grant is the, the proposals that have both aspects strong. Okay? But when I say strong, I don't mean that you have to have five first author science papers in order to get, uh, but that, that's what makes your track record. The important thing is that you have explained yourself and you showed your maturity in, in both aspects. Okay? So the, the proposal, the, the project itself, it has to be something new. Okay? It has to be based on your own uh, previous work. You have to show that you have the, the, the skills and the tools to, to make it feasible. But it has to be something new and it has to have risk. And I think we will talk about risk a bit later on. Okay? So it has to have that. For your own uh, track record, you have to tell your story and you have to explain what was your reasoning, how did you pick these five publications that you have to put in in the starting round, and what was your contribution? I can understand that like having like a million invite invitations for talks is not possible when, you, when you're at the postdoc level or PhD level, okay? So we, we, you are judged for that's the stage you are in your career. Like do not see, oh, I have to put on my invitations and my awards and I don't have any. It's, you're not judged the same level as an advanced grantee. <laughs> you're going to be just uh, to be compared with your peers. So it's, it's important that the best proposals are the ones who have both aspects and that uh, they have some kind of innovation in the project. So, and you mentioned risk just a while ago. And this brings me to my next question, because it's, all, it's often said when, you know, when you're having discussions with people uh, from ERC or some evaluating committees, they say, go for risky proposals, go for risky projects, you know, because uh, these are the ones which catch their eye. But how risky are the proposals supposed to be? Because how much risk is too much risk, right? So, because there's always a, a, a boundary that we need to adhere to, right? So, of course, they don't expect you to have the whole proposal to have high risk from start to end. <laughs> and, uh, and something that uh, you should avoid is having the biggest risk at the beginning. 
because then it's very easy for the panel members to say, ah, but if it doesn't, doesn't work, the proposal is dead, the project is dead. Okay, so it's very important that, um, that you split the risk in, in work packages. So what I usually see is that people start with one work package that has low risk. Second work package has more, more risk. Last work package, they go a bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is, it doesn't have to be throughout the whole proposal. It can be, usually people have three work packages. I don't know if this is the magic recipe or not. Um, and uh, so, uh, and when I say work packages, you can call them as you want, aims, objectives, because there's some distinction that we don't have work packages in the ERC. And um, so this is, the, but what is more important, and this is something that a lot of people fail at the step one is that there is this idea that you have to talk about your risk assessment only in the part B2. So the proposal at the ERC has two parts. Part B1, which is read at the first stage, this part B1 has five page summary of your project and, and then your CV and your track record. And part B2 is 15 pages and it's your whole project. Uh, so what people do is that they put the risk assessment only at the, at the B2, whereas the panel wants, it is asked to judge feasibility. So at step one, they judge feasibility. Step two, they judge the methodology. In order to judge the feasibility, they need some kind of risk assessment. And it's very often that you will see in panel comments, no risk assessment, no risk assessment. So it's very important that you write something in, in step one and in part B2, because it's it's more of a proof of maturity, this risk assessment, because it shows that you have, you didn't just say, oh, I'm going to do that. I thought about it. I thought, okay, what if it doesn't work? And it just, and for the starting grant, this is very important because it shows your maturity. And that's what they like more. Okay. So you were mentioning uh, that. Um there's like different aims you have to have and that your first part shouldn't be too risky. So how many like preliminary experiments should you, for example, already have uh, in your proposal uh, that you did after your postdoc um, that contribute to that project already? Because if you have a lot of experiments already, you could say, yeah, the aim is super secure, the first aim or a work package. Um, and then the other ones can be more risky. So, um, yeah, what would you uh, propose there? So officially, you don't need preliminary data. Okay, you the the what what is more interesting for the panel is like is that you, for you to have a hypothesis. The panels love hypothesis <laughs> driven research. So uh, this is um, so if you have a hypothesis and you can prove through the literature that that what you're proposing is correct. Okay, so this thing that you need a lot of preliminary data is is not is not uh, okay. It helps if you have some, but the whole point of the ERC is that we want to give the opportunity to everybody to um, to get a grant, whether they have pre prior funding or not. Because usually, to get preliminary data, you need to have prior funding, and if in if in your host institution, if in your country, you cannot get it, then it's. Um, it's problematic. So that's why we say we, you don't need preliminary data. But if you have it, it's good. Put, but you don't have, it's, it's not like you have to give preliminary data for your whole proposal. Hmm. So it's not like all the accepted uh, proposals that you guys uh, have no. um, had preliminary data. Okay. No. No, they have to prove that they can use, the, that they have the skills. Okay. They can say, okay. I have not tried using this equipment for this idea, but I, I can show you through this publication that I had with my postdoc supervisor, PhD supervisor, that I have done this before. Yeah, so maybe as, as the next question then, uh, we can talk about the, the formal conditions that a um, applicant uh, needs to fulfill in order to um, get the grant. Um, so like, are there some criteria that you set for applicants? Um, Aside from their like the the time after their PhD, so so this is the, the eligibility criteria is that you have to have a PhD, you have to send us your PhD certificate, uh, you need to be in, in the in the range, and you need to have a letter from your host institution. And this is why we usually advise people like even before writing your proposal, get in contact with your host institution's manage, uh, project management office. 
because they are the ones who will provide you with the letter and you don't want to, to, to have to chase the president of the university or the president or the head of the Max Planck Institute to sign your, your paper. Um, and, um, and also, more, more importantly, that these people very often have a lot of experience and they can help you with your proposal. They can either show you previous proposals that have been successful, they can bring you in contact with other people that can read your proposal. They can even read the proposal themselves. Like, for example, this is what I used to do when I was in CNRS. Uh, I used to use uh, read people's proposals just to see if it makes sense to a non-specialist because in ERC panels very often it's generalist. So um, so it's, it's very important that you do that. Uh, apart from that, we don't have any other formal requirements. I mean, one thing that you mentioned briefly was that uh, dependent on, like, let's say you apply once, uh, you're just after your postdoc, you apply, and then you don't get it. And now dependent on what grade you got, you cannot apply the next year immediately, right? Yeah, it's, it's the what we call the submission restrictions. These were put in, because the numbers of proposals at the beginning of the ERC were very high. Uh, so they, for C, it's two years. For B, it's one year. If you go to step two, you can apply in the next year. So even if you get a B in the step two then? Yes, you can apply the next year. Ah, okay. So, so the restrictions are only for step one. Okay. That's good to hear. Yeah, but I mean, I understand, right? I mean, you get like so many applications uh, for every round. Yes. <laughs> so it depends on the, on, of course, the, num the number of panel members in each panel ranges between 12 and 17. So the more proposals a panel gets, the more panel members they have. But it's true that there is a range that panel members that can read between 25 and 45 proposals at step one. And you can imagine reading so many proposals. It's not easy for them. It's a very high workload. So this is the easier you make their life, the better. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, after submitting the proposals and, you know, being uh, so funded, so what do these fundings technically include? So is there a, a restriction on number of PhDs or postdoc positions for materials and equipment in different fields? So how are these uh, assigned? Or is it up to the person who applied for the grant to decide on these? So it's up to the person uh, to apply that, that applies. So it's 1.5 million uh, that, uh, that is the maximum that you can apply for in the starting grant. And within this, you have to always remember that there is this thing that we call an indirect cost or overhead that is 25%. So basically, say if you want to ask for 1.5 million, the things that you can ask for are, is 1.2 because then you have to add this 25%. So uh, this, this money that you ask for this cost, they can be personnel costs, they can be senior staff, postdocs, PhD students, other personnel costs, technicians. Uh, then you can have subcontracting costs if you need to get a service, if you need something to be sequenced, or um, then um, you have, and then you have purchase costs. You can get equipment, you can get consumables, travel. One very important cost is open access uh, for for papers because this is obligatory, uh, and if you don't publish open access, completely open access, uh, it's uh, you can get penalty now it's we are quite strict about that um, and then if you need to use in, internal services you can also put this on on the thing and um, you can ask uh, we say 1.5 million is is the maximum but you can ask 1 million more and which are the cases where you can ask 1 million more it's if you are moving from outside europe into europe so you can get, just get 1 million like that um, if you need to purchase major equipment. And the panels always ask us, what, it does, what is the definition of a major equipment? We, we don't have a very precise definition, but like, it should be something that has at least more than 150,000, like something like that. Usually pa panels would, would, yes, yeah. they would consider that as, because sometimes we see major equipment, 20,000 euros. And then the panels are like, mm, this is not really major. Um, 
that this is 150,000 is my definition, it's not the official definition. So uh, it's just I'm just trying to to guide people. Then for access so you're to the ballpark figure that we want yeah. to keep in mind. Yeah. Okay. Um, the access to large facilities, like if you need to use, I don't know, synchrotrons or if you want to go and work in CERN, you might have. Uh, um, and then there's a fourth category that has been added that is called other major experimental and field work costs. Uh, so if you are an archaeologist and you need to go to Ethiopia to dig a site, that's also an extra thing. So these are the, um, the things. So. Uh, some some information about the budget. So the budgets are only seen at step two, uh, and this is part of. And we are asking panel members to have a very careful look at the budget. Um, panels do not do micromanagement. They will never say, "Ah, your salary is too big." Okay, <laughs> they they will never say, "Ah, I think this consumables." Ah, they're asking too much. They do not do this kind of, of because they don't know how much it costs in in maybe they know how much it costs in Germany, but they don't know how much it costs in in uh, Lithuania. So there are there are some cases where they do budget cuts, okay, and this is on proposal by proposal basis, and they have to justify it why this funding is not uh, um, is. is it's not justified. Uh, there's, we have heard that there's a rumor there that like to ask for the maximum because either anyway they will cut it down, so it's better to ask for more. So then you get what. But like if you ask for more, then it, it's inflated and they can see the panel members can see that it's inflated, so they cut it anyway. So just ask for the money that you really need. Uh, it, also, in terms of supervisory experience, if you're a postdoc and you have a supervised like one PhD student with your uh, head of, uh, of lab, um, I would say, do not say, okay, I'm going to hire five postdocs. Like, put some PhD students there. Make sure that even in part B1, you say, okay, these are the team members I'm thinking of hiring. And I'm thinking, okay, for this task, the PhD student will be okay. This is more advanced. I will need a postdoc with this expertise. This information... It's not needed in part B1, but if you put them in, it makes the, the panel think, uh, think that you have really thought through your project um, and they want to learn more in part B2. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's uh, free for the people to decide what they want to use their budget on, like as long, as long as they can reason why they need it. And then if they have like something really big, let's say, I don't know, like sequencers or like large equipment, uh, then it's okay to apply for more funding. But this is then separate from the original funding. Yeah, you have to, there's a separate box where you have to specifically justify why you need this equipment. And um, and if I may say, do not say, oh, yes, my department has one of them, but uh, I would like to have one for my personal use. <laughs> this is, doesn't work very often. Because <laughs> then the partner can say, okay, they have one in the department, we might as well give them, like, there's no point giving them the money for it. Okay. So uh, let's move on from the funding part because I think we've been discussing rather extensively about it into the research evaluation part itself. So how uh, accurate or what sort of scientific criteria do the ERC use to evaluate the research proposals and how important is the publishing history of the person who's applying? Yeah, so I, as I mentioned before, we say excellence. It's the only criterion, okay? So both for the project uh, and the PI. Um, okay, so as far as publishing history is concerned, so in the starting round, you're asked to select five publications. If you have more than five, if you, have, if you don't have five, you put as many publications as you have. Um, so this is part of your, so you have two pages for your CV and two pages for your track record. So this is in your track record. Um, and what panel members really love, and they get really upset that the, the applicants do not give them the information, is that for each of these five publications, you need to say, what is your contribution? And maybe why did you choose it? Like, for example, you could say, in this con in this paper, I contribute. I you, I did this part of the paper, and this shows I have the skills for AIM one point two. 
Uh, I am putting this paper because this is my paper with the most citations and I found that in here I was the most creative. Like, give information for, for these five papers. They do not have to be in nature and science. It, more important is to say, uh, this paper was, uh, it, it was, it changed this in the field or like this is what happened. So this is, they like this more. And also in the track record at the beginning, before you put these five publications, you can say your story. I started with doing a, a degree in this, then I was interested in this, and that's how I chose my PhD supervisor and my, and my project. Then I was like, okay, I need to get this other skill. I went to do my postdoc there, and this is where I see myself going. So it's, a, it's important that you say your story, you put your publications. Okay, then if you have... Your conference in conferences you have presented, you put there. It, depending on the field, there are some conferences that give awards. There are some other conferences that don't give awards. So I've never heard I, in all the panel meetings. I've never heard mm, like we cannot give that to to this person because they don't have like top impact publications. Like I've never heard any of the oh the AIDS index is not good enough. Never, not even the advanced level. Like. It's um, especially at step two, the more weight is put on the project rather than the PI. Because even though you have these two things and they have the, the panel members, they need to give a grade out of five, the weight of the two is decided by the panel. So very often at step two, they put more emphasis on the project rather than on the PI. Okay, so maybe with this uh, emphasis on, uh, like in the first step on the PI to some extent, um, are there some ways in which you make sure that your evaluation process is not biased? Because I mean, the person, the PI then is kind of, uh, if it, they are the center point in the first part, there might be some unconscious bias, for example. So do you have like, uh, or do you also check uh, your um, history of funding uh, of funded proposals? Like if there's some bias by chance, uh, not, not by chance, but if there's some bias that you might have to address. So it's, it's a, today that we're filming, it's actually International Women's Day. So it's, it's actually, so it's to, to say that uh, the, the bias, start, we started to look at it through the gender bias aspect. And um, Actually, a couple of weeks ago, I gave a presentation just specifically on the on gender, and uh, so I so to, they started from the very beginning of the ERC having a gender issues working group uh, with, that had a gender equality uh, st strategy that started um, putting a lot of measures in place. So, for example, they they if you are if you are a woman that you and you have had a child. You have an extension to the eligibility window, and um, if you have, uh, and this was 18 months, if the child is before or after the PhD, then they what they did is that and they flipped the proposal the other way around. So before, when someone read the proposal, you started with the PI, and then you went to the project, and they they found that could influence how people see the the project. So now they have so you, they start with the project. And then they see the CV and their track record. Um, there used to be a section on leadership potential where the PIs had to self-evaluate themselves. And they found that some people were better at this than others. So this was removed. And then they, they found that some people are publishing more, uh, but lesser quality. And some people publish less but bigger quality. So that's why they restricted to five publications. So the panel members are able to compare more easily people with different numbers of publications. Um, and then around 2016, we started um, showing a video to panel members and uh, that uh, uh, points to them to, to biases. <laughs> and uh, we've watched this video so many times. It's, it's very cringy, uh, but it makes the point come across. And we have a slide in, in, the, in the briefing that we give the panel members, make sure that you take into account unconventional career paths, take into account career breaks, do that. And so up to then, we used to talk about gender bias. But in 2018, uh, we started talking about unconscious bias. And uh, what they thought was to give training to us, scientific officers, 
that are in the room to be able to identify and to make us aware of some unconscious biases that the panel members could have. Uh, and that's like uh, authority bias, conformity bias, uh, uh, like status quo bias, and all this bias. It was it was one of the best trainings I've ever had. It was it was amazing, and it was it gave us also the opportunity to discuss amongst ourselves, like what happens when we see that. What do we do? So now our eyes are open. I mean, they have always been open, but like now, now like we we are more trained to to do this and uh, and if i may can make a prediction that in horizon europe i think this group from that is called gender issues now is going to be called unconscious bias in the future because we are looking a bit more more general um and they are talking about that. so this is what we're doing and um, there are measures and the, the truth is that these measures at least in the case of women they have worked now the success rate of women and men is the same. Sometimes for women is a bit higher, uh, if I may say so. The number of, of, of applications it, at all levels, it's higher than the proportion of women out there. So it's, it seems that by taking simple measures, you can make a difference out there. So, um, But in terms of monitoring, we don't do any specific monitor other than looking at the statistics to see how many people from these countries, how many people from, um, how many women and all that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's very nice that uh, there were a lot of proactive measures which were taken to sort of make sure that this, uh, this bias that, you know, which, which exists in like naturally to be reduced and, you know, make it more aware. So bring it forefront. So people are aware of what they're talking about. So is there something that you think could still be improved in the whole evaluation process uh, other than just the biases? Or is there something that you wish could be improved yeah. as a part of uh, uh, the whole process? So uh, one thing I would also like to add is that um, I have to say that our, um, what is impressive is that the panels at the same time as us being more aware of these issues, also the panel members are aware of these issues. And I find it amazing when I see like the self more like self monitor and they say oh I should not have said that like do not hear like for, uh, pretend I didn't say it like oh no you should not say that this is not correct let's go back to the excellence so it's quite good and um, so in what is going to be improved uh, I think is is because the scientific council joined Dora I don't know if you had have, have heard of Dora um, in two, only a few months ago. So I assume that we're going to go towards this direction because still, even if they don't mention it in the panel meetings, I see the panel members, they do like say, okay, this person has um, uh, like so many citations in their, not so much in the starting grant, more in the consolidator and advance, but uh, it's, um, it, it will be better if these things are really out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think this is the, the idea. If, if people can present their publications without putting the metrics, it will be a big improvement as well. Okay, that's uh, very interesting to hear. We actually had a discussion with a person whose research was on research in the previous series of episodes. Ah. I think we got to learn a lot about DORA then. And uh, it's nice to see that the ERC is taking steps as one of the biggest funders in Europe to... Uh, really take this into consideration as well. So uh, we just have a few now, a few general questions about the ERC to address. So how many applications are actually approved every cycle? And uh, do you see there's a trend of the number of applications increasing uh, with every like renewal of the ERC? Okay, so what um, what we have found is that the number of applications is quite responsive to the budget available. I don't know how people do it, but uh, it's uh, like the more budget we have, the more applications we get. So we are expecting, now that we have a bigger budget, more applications to come. We are preparing emotionally <laughs> for this. Um, but uh, for example, like in the, the beginning of a framework program, like, like this, what we call uh, Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe, the budget is a bit like it's a bit stable, and then it starts going up. So then we see the proposal. On average, it's seven thousand six hundred proposals per call. 
and we found uh, per per year, sorry, and uh, we found around 940. But you will see when we announce the dates that we say that we have this budget and we expect to fund these people, this number of people. And then this you can compare compared to the previous years. So it's generally going, if, if the budget goes up, it goes up. If the budget goes down, it goes down. Uh, it's the success rates for starting run have remained more or less stable between 13 and 14 percent. It's the highest success rate that we have. The lowest is in advance, which can be seven or eight percent, and then that, that is really, very tough. So, in the starting run, I mean, they say this um, s- social scientists that are looking into science and technology studies, they say that a good evaluation is when the success rate is between, it's around 15%. So we are close to that. So it's quite fair. I mean, how has the number of grades, uh, or has that changed? Like, is there always a number of C grades and B grades and A grades in the first step? Or is this also improving or uh, becoming worse? So this depends on the panel. Okay, so you can have uh, panels that have very few Cs and panels that have many Cs. It depends on the quality of the proposals that they receive. So the scientific council is not giving any instructions. Um, I don't. I have to admit, I don't have statistics on the Bs and Cs uh, or As. Uh, but um, yeah, in my panel at least, I know that the quality is increasing. <laughs> This is what the panel say. <laughs> I mean, that, that's nice. Then there's also, like, it's nicer to review the uh, proposals, I guess, if they're good. Okay, so maybe then, uh, the, instead of talking about the proposals themselves, uh, rather the, the projects uh, that were funded by the ERC, so do you have some kind of, uh, or do you follow up on those projects that were funded to see if they are successful or not? And if so, what do you deem being a successful project? Okay, so the ERC is actually one of the very few agencies, maybe the only one, that we do post-project evaluation, okay? So what what we do is that, so we have two years after the project has ended, we get scientists there for, for each panel. So it's uh, we have these 25 little panels um, with uh, two, two uh, like three to four scientists Say that the, there are three scientists in, in a panel. Two of them, they have some experience with the ERC. And the third person has nothing to do with the ERC. They have never applied. They, have, they are not a grantee. They are not a panel member because we, want, we don't want to self-congratulate ourselves. <laughs> we want to have someone out there to, to be able to uh, keep us in line. And they, they look at the, um, the final report submitted by the PI so it's very important if you're if someone is a grantee that they write good reports, <laughs> uh, and uh, and they look at the publications that have come out of the project. Of course, you could say two years after the end of the project, you cannot really see the impact, but at least they can compare, like how things were when the project was funded to now, and uh, they do this uh, evaluation and they look at uh, different questions like the scientific impact, the introduction of new methodologies, interdisciplinarity, and a little bit the societal and economic impact. Uh, this is in some disciplines. You can see it more obviously than in others. So at the end, they give four kinds of grades. They give uh, A, B, C, or D. A is a scientific breakthrough. B is a major scientific advance. C is incremental scientific contribution. And then D is no appreciable scientific contribution. Okay, so the statistics, so we've been doing this since 2015 uh, for five years. Uh, and uh, on average, it's between, because it depends, it's a sample. We could take a sample of all the projects. Uh, it's between 18 and 25% of the projects are breakthroughs. And uh, then you have between 40 and 60% that they are major scientific advances. And then you have... Um, around 20% that is uh, uh, incremental and 4 or 5% that is um, no contribution. These are completely failed projects. Um, so we, we have been doing that. So they have been looking at the high, whether the high risk has paid off um, in a good way or a bad way. Uh, and, um, and if they have, but because they are scientists, they can find out, okay, yes, the high risk was high. 
and the projects in, in, in a sense failed because of this high risk, but they found out something different and this ended up being a scientific breakthrough. So it's not uh, fixed how how it's 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 done, but it's 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 very it's very positive for us to see that uh, we have the scientific breakthroughs, and it's it's good to see that uh, to present that we have some impact because very often our projects they do not have very direct societal impact now, um, and. Uh, so it seems, but uh, for me, very often they say, oh, we have 70% scientific breakthroughs or major scientific advances. No, it's 25% breakthroughs, a lot of major scientific advances. Let's not uh, exaggerate. <laughs> so, but that, does this evaluation of a certain project in a specific field have an impact on what amount of funding is allocated to that field later on? The, or the panels it, would like that, yeah. <laughs> but no. Okay. Because it's a random sample, so they cannot do that. Yeah. And, yeah. and how large is the random sample actually? It's a ten percent. It's ten percent of the of the projects that finished uh, two years on, before on the evaluation. Time. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So you do this every year as well. Every year, but this year we're not going to do it because a lot of the people they found that because they usually have nine projects to look at, and uh, nine projects is not so much to bring them to. To Brussels to do so now I think we're going to do it every two years to have a, a bit of a bigger range of projects. Lastly, maybe now that you um, that we've covered like uh, most of the topics, uh, maybe, maybe we can go to the European Parliament because this is the one that decides on uh, like the budget also for the ERC and so on, right? Or the, right. So how supportive is the European Parliament of the ERC, and do you have to report to them like every now and then? So the, um, the 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 decision is taken through this trialogue where you have like the commission making a proposal and then the council uh, and the parliament looking at it and then they are trying to, to negotiate between the two of them and but thank God we have the European Parliament because the European Parliament is very supportive of the ERC and uh, and even for Rise on Europe they were they they even blocked the overall EU budget for some time because they. They didn't think that Horizon Europe had enough money. Okay, after the negotiations, they added 4 billion euros. I mean, it's not little, <laughs> uh, 4 billion euros. So we have and only one of these 4 billion uh, came to the ERC. But, um, but nevertheless, they're very supportive. A lot of the MEPs, they, um, they collaborate a lot with us. Whenever they need information, we give them. And, and we had the very big chance of um, having Jean-Pierre Bourguignon come back because we had a bit of an upheaval at the beginning of last year in terms of president. Um, so he came back and he fought a lot. Um, but we also had this um, other thing called, uh, it's an organization that opened last year called the Friends of the ERC. Um, and they also launched a petition that uh, went to the European Parliament and they were able to, to support us even more. So European Parliament, they, are, they really are our friends. <laughs> that, that's nice to hear. Yeah. It's very good to hear. And uh, I think with that, we've come to the end of our list of uh, you know prepared questions. But uh, you mentioned to us previously before we started recording that you have uh, seven commandments of Dr. Agrofioti, <laughs> which you want to give to people. So perhaps you can go ahead with the, yeah. the list that so, you have prepared. So first of all, I want to say that the, the, the deadlines for 2021 were announced 10 days ago. So now you know that it's the 8th of April. So I'm not sure if this is uh, it's quite soon, <laughs> if we will have time to prepare the proposal. But uh, we are thinking that maybe next year they will, because normally the starting deadline is in October. So we are going to go back closer to that. So the information is on the website of the ERC, not, uh, so you can find what is part B1, part B2 works. Um, and, uh, and also that we've done recently some videos on the ERC YouTube channel uh, that are basically with Corona, we were not able to travel. Okay, so we can, so we found that we could not really spread the information. So these five videos, they are based on actually mine, <laughs> information session so i wrote the script so if you go there you will find how to write part b1 part b2 so go there but some points that i wanted to to give um specifically for starting grant is that like as i said before pick your panel 
first, it's very important. Look at uh, what are the, 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 the descriptors, what we say inside. That gives you an idea of the expertise. And look at who was at the panel two years ago so you can see more or less what kind of people are going to be in the panel. And give, help us help you by giving us uh, putting the, the keywords. So in part, when you start your proposal in part A, you can give us descriptors and keywords. Do not think, oh, this is administrative. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter. This is what we use to allocate your proposal to panel members. Okay? So if you don't give us information, you're making our life difficult and you might have inappropriate panel members. So this is um, the one point. Uh, for part B1, remember it's for generalists. So do not put too much jargon. Not too much highlighting, okay? Do, something doesn't have to be like bold, underlined, italic, all at the same time. Um, and try to, yes, you have to give some of the keywords groundbreaking, innovative, but do not feel too much because then they're like, Ugh, the panel members get to, it, it. They're scientists at the end of the day. You're not a car salesman, okay? So it's a, um, there's a lot of effort, a lot of emphasis on these words, but the scientists would like a bit to be toned down. Um, in the, for for the, your CV, we call it a recommended CV template, uh, but it, you can consider it obligatory because this allows, as I said before, panel members to compare these 25 to 45 pro proposals better. So by making their life easier, you, you make your, your project uh, chances for success uh, better. Um, so, okay. So a bit of... Um, so remember, in the starting round, you have to show that you are the leader of the project. And, and since you're, you're not so used to being the leader, you're usually in a collaboration of the head of the, your lab with someone else. And yes, you can go and have collaborators for techniques that you want to introduce into your lab, but make sure that, you don't, that they don't have the sort of power on it. So basically, if you want to get a new skill, take your postdoc, put it in the other lab, and make sure that you mention that they come back. Because otherwise, it looks more like a consortium, and this is something the ERC doesn't, panels do not like. Um, very important. Choose an easy to remember acronym. <laughs> because the people in the panel, they have to debate at the end, and they need to be able to say, oh, no, I think this proposal should get it. But if your proposal is X, Y, 1, 2, 3, 8, 5, 6, by the time the panel member has said it, it's a bit too late. Um, and yeah, well, as I said, do not leave it for the last moment of the eligibility window. And if I, I had gone last year to a um, retreat of uh, Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry postdocs, it was a wonderful uh, time I had I'd spent two days with them. And, um, and I went to them and I wanted to say to them, okay, so you're here at the Max Planck. So I expect every single one of you to apply because the rest of Europe says, oh, I'm not good enough to apply because I'm not in the Max Planck. Uh, so I was very surprised that not everybody wanted to apply for an ERC grant. Okay. So the message, like if you people do not apply, then who else is going to apply? So this is the message. There is funding available. You are in the top institutions. You have nothing to lose. It's an opportunity for, um, for you to write a proposal to, to think, okay, where do I want to be in five years' time? But even if you don't get the grant, you can give the feedback, you can apply for national funding. For me, there's no excuse why you should not, not everybody should apply for an ERC grant. So, good luck. Thanks a lot for the tips. And, uh, <laughs> I hope you don't get too many applications now. <laughs> It's okay. We like applications. That it's okay. the panel members. I have to read them. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I think it's uh, better to give them or make them make their job more difficult by giving a strong application rather exactly. than giving them, a, you know, eliminating yeah. criteria yeah. in your application. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, with that we've come to the end of our discussion for today. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Uh, thanks a lot for yeah. joining us. Uh, actually, I think it's. Uh, Today has been like an information overload for me. Yes. These uh, past 40 minutes discussing uh, different things. Again, uh, we really appreciate you for your time and thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. It's been fun. <laughs> 
Okay, that was a wonderful discussion uh, with Dr. Ino Agrafioti. I hope this information is helpful for all of you who are applying. Uh, Nico, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think the one takeaway for me is definitely that I shouldn't be afraid to apply for those ERC uh, grants um, because uh, as long as I consider the deadlines and um, so even if I get a C in the first round, I can still apply two years later if uh, if it's within the seven years after my PhD. So uh, I'll... Like let's let's see if I can make it work till then. I think one thing that she mentioned was that uh, please don't wait until you're seven years after your PhD to apply because that'll be that means you're towards the end of the 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 bracket. So just yeah. make sure that if you feel confident enough, you apply, and if you know if not, try to gain some confidence by you know thinking. And you and get the feedback. That's also the helpful thing, right? Definitely. So you're getting some feedback even if you're rejected in the first round, as far as I've uh, understood. So getting feedback on a proposal from experts uh, is like quite good. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, so I think with that, we've come to the end of this episode. So just keep in mind that this episode is rather abrupt and uh, we've brought this on soon because we know the ERC deadlines are coming up very soon. But we will have a preview episode with all the upcoming different discussions that we have planned and different types of interviews that we have planned for season two coming up next week or in two weeks rather. So keep that in mind and uh, stay tuned. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until then, Nico and I saying sayonara and we can't wait for you to meet the new team. And good luck to all the people that are uh, applying to the ERC. Definitely. Good luck to everyone. Adios. The podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net and the science communication working group known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Srinath Ramakumar and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. Please feel free to write to us with any feedback, comments or suggestions. And uh, the new hosts of the Offering Magazine podcast, which include Srinath Ramkumar, Nikolai Herman, Alison Lewis, Adrian Ahoya, Sandra Fendel, Beatrice Landsberger and also Simone Sundorf. So can't wait for you to meet the whole new team in the next episode. Until then, stay tuned. And it's Srinath signing off on behalf of the rest of my team. Bye-bye.